Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. In this fifth video, we're going to talk about how do you add context to your 3D scene so that your audience has a better understanding of what story you're trying to tell them as they look and live in that 3D space. So uh, let's talk about you know, where we're at so far in our trajectory. Up until this point, we talked about kind of planning out your story, searching for the 3D models you might use in libraries, and then we imported in a bunch of library uh, assets into our Blender project. We talked a little bit of an introduction to Blender, which can feel like it's a lot. And it really is a, uh, a lot of things to pick up just to get started. Hopefully you got some of that, or you went to the Blender tutorials from Blender Foundation or from Blender Guru, picked up a few more skills there. Now we're gonna talk about, you know, how do we add in a little bit more storytelling elements beyond just the 3D objects themselves? Um, you know. In your homework, you may have found as you showed your 3D to other people um, that your story might not have been totally guessable yet from just a couple 3D objects in a composition. Um, maybe you added a few more to make it a little bit more guessable, but you know, really when you think about it, even some of the most visual storytelling mediums, be it you know, a, a wall art at a museum, sculptures, charts, even videos, more often than not, they are still bringing in text and titles and photos and other elements that help provide context uh, in order to make sure that someone who's coming in to look at this visual story knows and is coming at it from the right place. They know the background they need to know, and they're looking at the scene from the right uh, point of mind. So as we think about our own 3D scenes, we may have to do some of the same. So where did we leave off a bit on the Mars project? Well, we already had positioned our, our rover and we put in uh, just our Mars 3D planet. But what are some other quick elements we might add in order to communicate more of the story around this lander? First, if our story is fundamentally about, fundamentally about the landing of the rover and where is it landing, a pin on the, on the planet might really tell us a little bit about where did it land. It landed here. Um, another thing is, you know, the white plane that we put down for the Mars rover may be enough for us to get started, um, but it might really add something to the scene to show a little bit of that Martian surface, a little bit of that Martian dust. And so we'll maybe let's let's talk about how do we add a picture to that ground that helps communicate a bit more of the environment, a bit more of the setting of this composition. Um, if we were doing something more advanced uh, and more advanced than what we're going to cover in this training, we might even animate the, the lander maybe coming down and kind of put, um, being set onto that, that sandy surface. Um, but that would of, of, of um, either a transform animation or a pose animation or an advanced animation, which are terms you might look for later uh, or look up later, um, is not something we're going to cover for beginners in this very first tutorial. So with that said, let's talk about, again, how do we add that pin? How do we add some of that image texture? So let's start with the pin. We've already done that. We did that pin exercise um, in the previous episode. And so let's talk about how do we add an object from one Blender project into another Blender project. We call that appending. And so if we come over to our Blender project, what we can do is we can find in our menus, back in our, our project from yesterday, file append. And here it basically just attaches a little something from another Blender project. So if I choose a pen and I navigate to my project I did yesterday, my create pen, um, your might be called pin.blend, uh, I can open up that. And now instead of just being an icon, it also sells me all the various things that are inside of a Blender project. So brushes, images, materials, so we have objects. And so in our objects folder, we find the one thing that was in there when we saved it, pen. Uh, and so if we go ahead and we click on that, we now find that we have imported in our pin. Um, this older version doesn't have the purple head on it that we had in the, in the previous episode. We could always add that in again if we wanted to, but for the purposes of our pin, this is enough. We'll just use this white one. So I've imported it in. I can now use my transform tools like I used yesterday. So we've got the arrows to start with. I can move this pin around and I need to put it where it landed on Mars. Well, I happen to know already that the, the object landed on Mars, although well, we can use our tilde key trick to look at the planet, I know that it landed right about here. 
So I need to put my pin into that position. Well, obviously my pin right now is facing down. So one of the first things I need to do is I need to rotate it. Looking at my rotate tool, I can then grab the red arc and rotate it into more of like a getting ready to pin into that spot. And then I need to use my arrows again to kind of slide it over, slide it up. Oh, I've lost view. I gotta change perspective. Slide it over, slide it down. And we're getting pretty close. I feel like this pin is a little weird and it's so large right now. It's almost as big as the Mars itself. Maybe I will use my scale tool and I'll scale it down to be more of a pin size. And again, we'll take our arrows back and we will use our arrows to bring it into position fairly near where this happened. So that's pretty close to where the Mars River landed. I'm sure with some extra tweaking, we can get even closer. But there, there's our first context element. Where did it land? It landed there. All right. So with that done, we've talked about the second part we, we need to do, which is adding an image to our floor plane. So our floor plane that we have here is just plain white right now. If we click on it and we come to our material properties, the red BMW logo we talked about yesterday, and we click on our uh, material properties, we'll find, oh, this object currently has no materials. So the first thing we need to do then is add a new material. And so we now have one material slotted into this object called material.002. Maybe that's not specific enough. I can call this Mars surface. And then we can see that, okay, it's still just a white material. If I wanted to, I could try to make it kind of red or dusty color. And I guess that's a little better than it was before, but we can go an extra step further and we could actually add a photo or an image to be the thing that is the color of this floor plane. To do that, we're gonna go back to where our base color is, but instead of clicking on the color section, we're gonna click on this little yellow dot just to the side of where it says base color. Clicking on this dot will show us a context menu that has all the various ways you might be able to texture the base color. I'm gonna choose an image texture right here, fifth option on the second column. And now again, my image has changed. It's all black. That's because it's waiting for its image. It doesn't have an image yet, but it's a waiting one. So it's just empty black for now. I can see now, instead of having an image, a color selector, I have the ability to choose an image that's already in the project create a new image from scratch within Blender, or open an image file. We're gonna open one. In the files associated with this project, there is already a folder called images, and that includes one photo from the Ingenuity rover, uh, which is on Mars right now, uh, of the ground looking downwards. Um, photos from NASA JPL are in the public domain, so we can click on that photo and we can see our photo positioned now on top of this plane, which looks all right. But it's also kind of strange that you can kind of see the sky, and the end of the horizon in this image. So what we might do is change the way the image wraps itself around this plane. To do that is what's called UV editing. Now this is a fairly advanced technique, which involves uh, knowing how an, a 3D object and a 2D image are interacting. And it's not something we're going to go deep into during today's training, except to say it is a different workspace than our current layout workspace. This workspace involves a 2D image editor on the left and our 3D view on the right. When we switch, it may switch back to solid mode. You can change it back to material preview as desired. But you can see that the four corners of this object correlate with the four corners of this box that is in our UV editor. I can then scale, move, or position those points to change how the image lines up on the object. So if I hit scale and I scale down my box, looking on the right, you'll see that the image is zooming in and out. If I go bigger than the image, it starts to tile. If I go smaller than the image, it kind of zooms in. So maybe right about here, I can see the, the, the waves of the Martian terrain, but I'm no longer seeing the edge of the horizon or photos of the actual objects in this picture. So that's just a five second intro to UV unwrapping. 
If you're interested more in this, here are some great tutorials you can follow, either the UV mapping um, introduction article by uh, Archie Verma, um, or you can also look at the Blender beginner UV unwrapping tutorial uh, by Blender Guru on YouTube. So we've got ourselves now a scene that is a little bit richer feeling. It tells a little bit more of a story, but we really shouldn't assume what's good, what's working on our project. We should go get feedback. So let's just take a minute and now check with our editor on this project, our collaborator, Laura Herzl. Hey, Laura. So what do you think of this version so far? Oh, I think it's looking really good. Where did you pull those models? Are they both Sketchfab? They're both Sketchfab, but they were Sketchfab Creative Commons Zero from NASA JPL. So it's the same asset, and uh, we, we're not required to give anyone credit, but we'll probably still give NASA and Sketchfab credit. I think they'd appreciate that. I guess I have a couple questions um, looking at this just kind of coming in. Um, one is, is the story that we want to tell, like, where this is on Mars, how far it's going, or is it about the technology of building the rover itself? That's a great question. I think um, we probably don't know how far it's going because NASA hasn't shared any of its actual like mission plan yet, except for that it's supposed to be up there for a couple of years. Um, we could, you know, talk more about where it is um, and, because I think that's going to apply more to the coverage tomorrow. Um, and then we could do a follow-up that is more about like the instrumentation. I kind of want to break this into two pieces. One is where it is on Mars. So the, the rover plus, you know, maybe a, a billboard with that pin describing um, what the landscape is like, where it's going to be, and, you know, what that crater is, just a little more detailed information. And then the second, more digging into the actual technology of the rover, because I think people really will want to kind of move around it and get more detailed, and it might be too much to have the planet plus that rover, I think when people put it in their space, there, it might be a lot to kind of, you know, move around. That sounds great. Um, maybe for that second one, then we'll remove the Mars model out and instead we do like a cutout of an expert talking about it. If we can't get an expert, I guess we can just have our reporter uh, standing next to it and talking about the, the instruments. But um, I think, yeah, maybe we get rid of the, the Mars in that case. Yeah, I think even if you don't have the expert talking, but having the image of the person who's leading the mission, um, you know, show that cut out, or even like if there's a great picture of the group of scientists are working on this, something like that um, might be cool. And obviously, if we get the expert on audio talking about it, you know, have that person there, but something like that. Okay, cool. If we do the whole group, we probably won't do cutouts, but if we do one person, I think we need a cutout done for that just to put them in. Yeah, I think that would be great to see. Um, I think the cutout will probably take us uh, maybe about an hour and a half to get that one in there. And then the title cards only take us a couple minutes each. And so we'll get that added in post-haste. Perfect. Sounds great. All right, cool. We'll be back in a bit with uh, the, the updated version. Can't wait. So that was great. So let's talk about some of the takeaways from that context recap meeting. First, her note was really, if we're having more stories going forward, we should start to prepare separate scenes. So if we have one story that's really focused on where it is landed, then for that scene, we should probably add some title cards that describe the position in our Blender scene of the pin. What's the name of that crater? Where is it at? For the other project, which might be more about the mission leaders and scientists, um, for those, we really want to show that subject. We want to show who we're talking about. So we may add some two and a half D cutouts, and maybe a team photo if we can find one. Um, also, we may then for that scene, remove the Mars planet and the pin. Um, because in that, in that particular story, the Mars planet and pin would be getting in the way of a cohesive narrative around the team that worked uh, on that particular element that we're gonna cover in the story, in the article, in the video. So getting back into that, let's start talking for a second about title cards. Um, adding titles in Blender could be done a couple different ways, or adding titles into your 3D scene can be done a couple different ways. In Sketchfab, you might add annotations. In Blender, there's even what's called a 3D text tool. However, if you want to keep something really simple, very clean to read, and probably a little easier for you to edit if you're used to working with photo editing software, we can use something called a title card. A title card is just an object that already has a UV unwrapped image that can go with it. So if you look in the folder uh, that is, goes with this particular episode, uh, you'll find a subfolder called title cards. 
In that title card folder, you'll find three things. The title card GLB, which is the 3D object of the title card. The title card template PSD Photoshop file, which allows you to easily type over the text that's in the card or change other design elements if you want to change how the title card looks. Then a title card placeholder JPEG. This is obviously a much simpler export of the basic title card, uh, which you can then use to uh, just edit that and kind of follow the shapes that are already in there to put new text in using a different photo editing software other than, blend, or other than Photoshop. Um, or you can, of course, just use that then to uh, test if a title card is working in a future project. So what we need to do off the bat is import in our title card GLB, maybe position it, get it where we want it to go, and then we're going to edit the title card template in order to put in the text specific for this project. So back into Blender, we now have our 3D scene again, and we need to import in our title card. So we've already seen in here, it's a GLB. GLB is part of the GLTF family. So file, import, GLTF, which includes GLB. <clears throat> Navigate your way to the folder for title card, and then find your title card.glb. When you import it, here we can see it imports into the position that's at the center of the scene. I need to use my arrows to move it into a new position. And let me let's put it just to the right of our pen. Now, as I bring it in, it still has the placeholder language on it. So instead of using that placeholder language, let's put a custom set of text in there. So back in our folder, we'll also find our title card template. If we open that title card template with Photoshop, we can quickly edit some of the text related to it. Here in Photoshop, we can find uh, our template has loaded up. It's a variety of layers, including just some labels that, you know, this is the front of the card, this is the back of the card, and then headlines and body, and all running on a standard font that you would probably have access to, the Arial font. So to swap stuff out, I can use my text tool, and I can just click on the headline and say, all right, what is the name of this crater? Well, it's landing in the Jezero Crater. And what do I want to say about the Jezero Crater? Well, how about we just say where it landed and when? Um, we could give more details around there uh, if we know them, but that might be just a really simple piece of context to help explain some of the story. So we can say like the pin marks where Perseverance rover landed on the red planet on February 18, 2021. That, that alone tells us a bit of the story about this object. If you didn't know the name of it, we've actually now provided the name of the rover, provided the name of the crater, and next to the pan, that should provide some more storytelling context. But what do we do on the back? Well, on the back of the title card, you could put the exact same thing, if this object being seen from both sides as people rotate and look from different angles, or you might put a different set of facts, or one of the things I like to do is somewhere in your project, put your credits. So if you're working on a project, you might say credits, and then back here, you would put like, you know, your name here. So maybe that's like, you know, you're produced by, and you'll go ahead and put your name in there. Um, you may also want to provide uh, your photo credits for a photo or a series of photos that you use. We're currently using a photo for our Mars terrain. So photo of Mars, and we'll say NASA JPL. Um, and then also, where are you getting your 3D models from? Well, we're getting some 3D models uh, that are NASA JPL models, but we're also getting them through Sketchfab. And if you were paying attention, we got them from a user named Thomas Flynn at Sketchfab. So we might have to give them credit. <coughs> models by NASA JPL via Thomas Flynn slash Sketchfab. This is not the correct uh, verbiage if it's Creative Commons attribution. You would say then uh, via CC by 4.0. But because these were CC0, this is more of a, um, th this is not necessarily required to give attribution, but we're going to do it anyway. So with that gone and typed out, all we need to do now is in Photoshop, we can do save as and save this as a JPEG. And so we'll call this title card. Uh, Jezero Crater. Also with title cards, not necessary to uh, 
have 12 out of 12 maximum quality. Um, I generally will make my Kettle cards somewhere between six and eight, um, just to save some file size. So I'll maybe save this as seven. In our project folder, we should now see our Jezero Crater JPEG. And as we come back to Blender, clicking on our title and going back to our material properties, uh, the red BMW logo, we can find that base color, we expand it, it's currently running an image called sample title card, uh, something something dot JPEG, so sample title card dash placeholder image texture. I can disconnect that or unlink the data block by pressing this X on the end. Doing that gives me the opportunity to put a different title card in. So now I can press open, navigate back to my title I just created and select that title. And now here we go. We have our new custom created title card in our project. Now that wasn't the only note that, that Laura gave us. She also suggested that we uh, maybe add some cutouts to a separate scene. So for this separate scene, also worth noting in Blender, we should add our title card back into our collection. How about we save this project as a distinct name? So save as, uh, and we can put it anywhere we want to put it. We take Mars Rover, where it landed. But we need to have a separate one, which we're going to use cutouts. Now, we're not going to go deep into cutouts right now, but cutouts are a method of taking a flat image and sort of making a 2D, 2.5D, 3D object out of it. Um, and so you, then we can kind of crop it and place it into a project. Now, we have made a separate tutorial that you can follow to learn how to make a 2.5D cutout. You can search that by finding uh, creating 2.5D cutouts with Blender on YouTube. Uh, but the basic steps are we crop the image in Photoshop. We then use Photoshop's a tool to create a custom shape from the cropped image. Um, we then line up the shape and the texture image, the original color version, uh, separate from the shape. We export the shape as a scalable vector graphic and the image as a JPEG. Then in Blender, you can import your scalable vector graphic, turn it into an actual 3D object, and then apply using UV editing to the texture on top of the uh, uh, 3D object that you've created. And then you've got now a 3D object that shows the conformity of the shape of the person, as well as the image of them on the front, potentially on the back or on the side as well. So that tutorial will walk you through how to create uh, those cutouts. Here, as we look back to our Blender project, we will find a version of the scene that's had the planet pin and cut and title removed and has some of those cutouts already in place then. So with them there, let's talk about for a second what makes a good cutout. Um, a few things that are really useful for a good cutout is a photo of your subject that goes from head to toe, because obviously in most cases, we wanna put their feet on the ground um, and then we can scale them to kind of accurately reflect their height in real life against the other 3D objects that are in the scene. In the photo of your subject, you wanna have nothing that obstructs them, no other objects that are really in front of them or are too close to them and feel like it's a part of them. Um, also, what's really great is when you have feet that are side by side. When you have feet that are side by side, you can put both feet on the ground and that'll be a little easier to work with. Compare that to this person over here who also worked on the NASA Rover 2020 project. The feet are one in front of the other. And so now the 3D model has got a more tippy toe feel once the background photo of the ground is removed. Other things that make a great uh, photo for that, if the camera is fairly parallel to the ground, not high angle, not low angle, it helps the person kind of really feel like they're looking at you. Um, when the camera is at low angle or high angle, it's kind of easy to tell that they were you were looking up or down at them based on the way that their body is seemingly sloped, um, even though they are a flat object. Portrait photos are oftentimes better than landscape because all the pixels and all the detail is then kind of following the curve of the body. We don't need all the pixels of the area that was around them from side to side. And also you want images where the subject doesn't fade into the background, where they can be very cleanly and crisply cropped from the background so that you can add them into your 3D scene or add any artificial backgrounds that you also need. Note that there are what's called likeness rights, which means you cannot just uh, publish uh, 3D representations 
of celebrities or really of anyone without their consent unless you have a strong editorial purpose. Why are they in your story is such an important thing to include. So it's worth saying you don't want to include cutouts in sponsored content or ads or editorial, e-commerce, um, games, uh, even basic things like, oh, take a selfie with. No, because in that case, you're basically saying, take a selfie with a celebrity who didn't ever agree for you to take a selfie with them. Instead, you really want to be focused on, they are part of the story. This scientist was the director of this program. This scientist developed a key component related to this program. And then describe who they are and why they're in there to make it really clear uh, the usage of their image in this project. If they gave you consent, you should be fine. But if you're working with images from libraries, you want to make sure you have a strong editorial purpose of someone before you've just made a 3D representation of them inside of your project. Definitely think ethically to consider the ways in which this person might be used uh, when they interact, interact with them to their own ends. Um, and make sure that you discuss your usage with a lawyer before publishing. So having made some cutouts and added some more context to both our story about the landing and our story about the team and instruments, go ahead and now create some context for your own project in session four. Uh, your session four project had your 3D scenes that were already in there, add at least two title cards. And if you can, try to create and add a cutout uh, where applicable uh, using either photos that you take yourselves or photos that you've licensed from the internet. Um, again, now take this new contextualized version of your story, test it with a user, and see if they understand the story that you're trying to tell without you providing any uh, precursor explanation. Give that a go, and we'll see you in session six to talk about how to package this so that you can actually put it on a website or in an article. See you then.